Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, taking you inside the courtrooms and trials of high profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based here in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. We are recording this on Friday, March 25th, 2022. And today we are excited to be joined by a former prosecutor who has made his way into television. You may know him from Court TV. Please welcome Emmy Award winning legal journalist Vinny Politan. Vinny, thank you so much for coming on. Great to see you. We're talking about notorious cases. We've got a couple of notorious lawyers here today. right? (laughs) I hope we're suited properly for the job. I think we are. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about uh, several high profile cases making headlines that you talk about daily on your broadcast. And I know listeners are eager to hear your take because you follow them so closely. But before we jump into all of that, can you please tell us a little bit about your background and how you went from a prosecutor uh, to the anchor chair? Yeah, this, you know, it was really coming back to my first love when I was an undergrad and my whole life, I have microphones in my hand. I mean, I'm sitting in my home studio and I'm surrounded by audio tapes from the time I was like, you know, seven years old, uh, little cassettes. I've got reel to reels. Um, My father bought me a video camera like in the early, early 80s. And I just started, you know, recording (laughs) myself and others. So it was really my first love. Uh, um, But my other love was was the law, which was I call it also a genetic defect, right? Because my father and my brother, both lawyers, my father became a federal judge. So that was a big influence in my life. So um, with that influence and, and, and the love of what I do, I, I, right now I've put everything together that I love, you know, to be able to be on television, but have an area that you have passion about to talk about. You're not just generically talking about whatever, I'm talking about stuff that I, I love, I, I breathe, I eat. I was reared on cop shows and lawyer shows and, and you know, my dad telling his stories from the courtroom. So um, it's really like full circle for me. But the, making that transition was not easy because nobody wants to be the first person to pay you to be on TV. So uh, <laughs> it took some wrangling to do that. That's fantastic. I, I know exactly how you feel, both my father and brother are lawyers as well. And is, is try as I might, it was like I was predestined to go to law school, but I'm happy that I did. And, and I'm happy that I'm sitting here talking to you about it. Um, OK, so let's jump right in. The, fir- the first case is Billy Ray Turner. This was a f- conviction that came down um, just recently in the slaying of former NBA player Lorenzen Wright, whose body was found in a field in Memphis riddled with gunshot wounds. A jury found Turner guilty of first degree murder, attempted murder and conspiracy. And he's already been sentenced to life in prison uh, for the murder conviction. He'll be sentenced on the other charges later. Prosecutors allege that Wright's ex-wife, Shira Wright, uh, was behind the whole plot to kill him. The alleged motivation was an insurance policy for nearly a million bucks. Uh, She entered a surprise guilty plea to facilitation of the murder back in July of 2019 and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Uh, Shira allegedly enlisted the help of Billy Turner, a landscaper she met in church to carry out the hit with another gentleman named Jimmy Martin. And Jim Martin is himself serving 20 years uh, sentence for the murder of his girlfriend. Shira lured uh, Wright to a remote uh, location where he was ambushed and the prosecution played. uh, And you can tell us more about this, a very chilling 911 call made by Lorenzen in which you can hear the gunshots that most likely took his life. Um, My first question is the verdict came back in this case in less than three hours. Was that shocking to you? Not necessarily. I mean, you, you, you either, because this is a case, right? Where people who were involved, Jimmy Martin is one of the people involved in the plot. So he had all the inside information. So you either believe him or you don't believe him. And if the jury believes him, which they did, Um, it was easy to put this whole thing together. To me, this trial um, really puts a spotlight on on prosecutors and difficult decisions they have to make and how they decide to prosecute cases, right? Because this is when we've got a conspiracy, three people, but who is the most culpable in all of this? Why was Lorenzen Wright murdered? Because of Shara, his ex-wife. If she doesn't want him dead, He's still alive today, right? He's still alive, yet 
prosecutors in the way they went about this case, um, she pleaded guilty to facilitation. She'll have an opportunity for parole, I think, in like 2026. Uh, I don't know if she'll get it, but at least she'll have the opportunity for parole in 2026. But she was the mastermind of the whole thing. And I don't, sometimes I, 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 I'm a former prosecutor, but that means when I look at these cases, I look through that, that prism and I'm, I'm wondering why did they do it this way? Why did they do it this way? Because murder for hire cases, um, to me, it's the person who's pulling the trigger isn't necessarily the most culpable, believe it or not, because yeah. to me, yeah. it's about who wants this person dead, who is putting the wheels in motion, and everything pointed to her, including the star witness of the prosecution, the one who got immunity, Shara Wright's cousin, Jimmy Martin. So um, Jimmy Martin gets a deal. Cheryl Wright gets a deal and, and, and Billy Ray Turner goes down. I mean, from my perspective, they all should be doing life in prison, but right. obviously to prove the case, you gotta, you gotta pick and choose and, and make deals. And, you know, these are the types of cases that 20 years from now, people would be saying, Oh, he was, he was, he was convicted because of the, the testimony of a murderer. And should we take another look at it? And that's what I'm afraid could happen down the road here. Yeah. You make such an excellent point about, culpability. Uh, I, I, you, you remind me of one of the very first cases I worked on as a law clerk when I was in the DA's office it was a horrible murder for hire case that was a death penalty case. But there were two gentlemen on trial. One was the person who actually went into the house and beat this elderly couple to death with a tire iron. It was awful. The other gentleman was never alleged to have ever even entered the house, but he was the one that put it all together, conspired he got the death penalty and the one who actually had the tire iron in his hand did not. And I thought that was such a, a, a smart set of jurors who were able to realize, like the point you just made, it's about culpability that Lorenzen would be alive today if it wasn't for Shara Wright. Absolutely. And back in my home state, when they used to have the death penalty, that was an aggravating factor. Murder for hire. If you're hiring someone, that would get you the possibility of going to death row. So um, I always saw it that way because it goes back to law school. Remember the old but four test, right? Not um, the but three, not the but five, the but <laughs> four test. But four, Cheryl Wright, Lorenzen is alive, and the father of her children and his children have a dad. And, and now they don't because of her. But now she gets the opportunity to get out someday. And, and to me, that's that's just not right. But I didn't know all of the intimate facts and, and evidence that they had and the trouble that they had, because remember, it took years for them to solve this case. Yeah. Years. So I, I, I understand that. And I take that with a grain of salt, but I, I know what's going to happen 10 years down the road. Um, there's going to be all this noise. There's going to be some celebrity out in La La Land where you live coming to bat for Billy Ray Turner. He's wrongfully convicted. He didn't do it. It was, it was Shara and her cousin who did it. And, and, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, you're right, though. Difficult decisions that prosecutors have to make. Obviously, they made the right ones here if they were able to convince a jury in three hours. But I, I hope that you are, are incorrect in your prediction that this causes problems later on down the road. But I can see how it might. OK, completely switching gears now to a totally different type of case. This is dealing with Dr. William Husel. This has been going on for some time, this trial now. He pleaded not guilty to 14 counts of murder while acting as an ICU doctor at Mark Car Carmel West from 2015 to 2018. Through the first four weeks now of the trial, 43 different witnesses have taken the stand, including a Dr. John Schweiger, a Tampa anesthesiologist and critical care physician recently took the stand. And he said, and this was really damaging evidence that I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, I think damaging to Mr. to Dr. Hughes. He said that in 13 of the 14 cases, the amount of fentanyl prescribed hastened the death of the patient. And in reference to one patient in particular, the doctor said, in my professional opinion, the intention was to rapidly terminate this patient's ability to breathe on his own and consequently hasten his death. Um, what has clearly become established is that these doses were high, but I, I don't think that's really in contention, that they were higher than kind of what standard practice was. But my question for you is, is that enough to prove intent to a jury, as that expert just pointed out? 
This is a difficult, difficult case for prosecutors. I understand why they're why they're going forward with it. This isn't a case of, of malpractice. They're saying that he's intentionally doing all of this, yeah. that he's trying to kill these patients. Um, I think the one advantage prosecutors have is the is the F word, fentanyl. Um, I think fentanyl has finally gotten onto the national radar and people understand how dangerous and deadly it is. And they're going to kind of look at this doctor who seemed to be, um, you know, kind of in love with uh, prescribing and over prescribing fentanyl. Now, there's going to be a defense, though. Right. You know, because you're talking about human suffering, trying to alleviate human suffering and a doctor who's too aggressive, but then you've got to get to cause of death for all of them. And there's going to be a, on top of all these other doctors, a battle of the experts as to how and why everyone died. And um, to me, it's a difficult case. The X factor in all of this, okay? The X factor in all of this is who is the doctor's attorney? It's Jose Baez, okay? He's got, I don't know what he stepped in when he took the bar exam. I don't know what happened, but he's got some sort of a magical touch in the courtroom in super high profile, seemingly unwinnable cases, right? I mean, wow. I don't like to say her name. So I talk about the victim, Kaylee Marie Anthony, little girl uh, who died down in Orlando, Florida. Her mother was accused of her murder, Jose Baez. I think it was his first murder trial. Uh, represented her and, and uh, we saw what he did in the courtroom and, and what he did in, in that case and, and another one uh, Aaron Hernandez was a convicted murderer he was an NFL superstar but he represented him and, and in a strong prosecution case and the jury came back not guilty so I think what Jose Baez brings to this in a case where there is I um, mean there are real arguments to make here is he's, he's been able to connect with jurors. And to me, you know, we talk about the law, we talk about the facts, we talk about the law, we talk about the arguments, right? We talk about all that. But ultimately, in these close cases, a jury, I believe, from watching these for years and years and years, a jury gets a sense of which messenger do I trust a little bit more? Yeah. And, if, and if there's a clear clear distinguishment between you know how one lawyer is perceived in the courtroom and how the other is in a close case um i think that trust is going to go and again remember it's not about proving his case he's just got to raise raise enough doubt but he has a way of bonding with the jury i'll give you the example joshua in the in the case down in florida down in orange county florida and I, I you know i was watching this every morning he would turn to the jury and say Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. And in the beginning, it was a little awkward and weird. By the end of that trial, he would say good morning, all 12 of them, plus wow. the alternates would say good morning. And it was like getting louder and louder. And I didn't pick up on that being so important until we spoke to the jurors afterwards. The prosecutor was seasoned. He was intense, but he was a little arrogant in the courtroom. He was a little overconfident um, and rubbed the jury the wrong way. And it made such a difference. So that's the X factor here for the doctor. One, you've got a client who is a doctor. Two, you've got uh, victims slash patients who are suffering. And you've got Jose Baez, who has a magical touch in the way he can bond and, and, and connect with a jury. Yeah, you, you, you make such a, a powerful point about trust, that he's creating that trust, that if it, it doesn't matter how skilled you are, what kind of legal acumen you have, uh, how, 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 you know, how, how great you are on cross-examination, if the jurors don't trust you as an attorney, then when you get up to speak in closing argument, they're not going to believe a word that's coming out of your mouth. But if they trust you, they'll go to the bank with everything that's coming out of your mouth. And if he's building that kind of trust with the jurors. I absolutely agree with you. He could pull this thing off. And I agree with you. It's a difficult case with the prosecution. Um, I wanted to circle back to one thing that you said earlier about that. These are people who were close to dying as it was, that this is end of life care that he was giving to these folks. And the question that I've always had is, OK, fine. These are people who may be dying within hours or days as it was. What is his motive then? Why is he doing this? Is he doing this to give them kind of peace and allow them to painlessly enter death? 
Or is he really trying to kill them or hasten their death, as the expert points out? Do you think that's a question that the prosecution needs to answer, that question of motive? I think so. Uh, you know, it's not an element of the crime. It's nothing you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, according to the instructions that the, the judge will give the jury. Um, but I think you do have to answer that question. Uh, and, and I think in most cases, prosecutors really have to give some sort of a viable motive. When you have a defendant who is, you know, outside of this case, you would look at the defendant and say, well, you know, wow, he's a doctor, very impressive, you know, things like that. When you have people who are career criminals, I don't think the why is quite as important. But when you have people, and this is often the case in some of the trials we cover on court TV, these are people that aren't part of the criminal justice system normally. So why on earth would a doctor risk everything? He's yeah. making great money. He's got prestige. He's studied his entire life. He's taken that, that oath. Why would he do this? And I wonder if the jury believes it's to lessen human suffering. Um, if you believe that that was what was motivating him, could you still find him guilty of murder? I don't Interesting. know. Yeah. I don't know. So that's yeah. the, that's going to be the challenge. And uh, I'll be interested to see how this all turns out, because it's a it's a long trial. It's very involved. It's, it's very technical on many levels. But at the end of the day, I think it comes down to exactly what you have isolated as the most important issue in the case. Yeah, it, they, I, I agree with you. They don't have to answer it. But in a case like this, I think they're making a huge mistake if they don't give something for the jurors to hang their hats on as to why this acclaimed doctor would all of a sudden start taking people's lives. We'll be, we'll be watching it closely as I know you are. Okay, turning now to Jennifer and James Crumbly. These are the parents of the Oxford High School shooting suspect, Ethan Crumbly. Each parent is facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Currently, they were represented by attorneys who work in the same law firm, and the parents have expressed that they have no issues with that arrangement, but the prosecution wants to avoid any conflicts of interest. Uh, under the Sixth Amendment, the Crumleys have a right to counsel of their choice. Um, trial protocols call for lawyers and their clients to state on the record in court that they understand and are comfortable with their arrangement. And an, in another new development, the prosecutors have issued, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on this, uh, what's called a no notoriety request which was not challenged by the defense. Um, they will not use the name of Ethan Crumbly, the, the, the young gentleman shooter here in the proceedings, and said they're referring to him instead as the shooter. Uh, let, let's talk about that. Have you ever seen that before? I know that oftentimes uh, journalists and news organizations will make a decision themselves to not publicize the name. But have you ever seen that before where it's a court order that in the proceedings they will only refer to him as the shooter? No, never have. And I'm always afraid when I see something I haven't seen before, um, if if and when there's a conviction, uh, how does that, uh, you know, lurk uh, on the appeal and, and the chance to do it again? Uh, but this, again, this isn't the trial of the shooter himself. Right? right? He's got his own separate case. It's it's of the shooter's parents. But I, I don't know how that's going to work. I mean, you're going to have a whole trial. You've got the parents. The whole case is, yes, it's about the parents, but it's really about the shooter. And yeah. it's, it's going to be bizarre to watch how they can dance around this the whole time. My guess is his name's going to come up. It's, it's just going to come up. Uh, inevitably, whether it's pur purposely or accidentally. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I don't I, the more I think about it, you know, so much of this case for the prosecution is going to be about what didn't they do in caring for their son and where should they have intervened? And how are you constantly going to be referring to him as the shooter when talking about that? Well, they didn't they didn't go get the shooter uh, proper mental uh, therapy, did they? And then they purchased a gun for the shooter. It just seems like it will create such a bizarre attention to the fact that they're not using his name that I agree with you. I, 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 I feel like it might just present problems and I know they're trying to prevent this whole notoriety thing, but it, I think they should be more concerned with doing things right in court than whether how this is perceived outside of court. Um, what, tell me your, your thoughts on the pros, on a prosecution of a case like that. I mean, my understanding is it's first of its kind, right? Where you're prosecuting two individuals, who no one is alleging took play part in the actual act of the murder, but that they didn't properly care for, uh, uh, protect, or somehow intervene with an independent person's decision-making and their own actions, and they're being prosecuted for it. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, this is what we've been talking about since the beginning of the case because of the very specific facts of this case. Because um, also looking at the school, so the 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 uh, the shooter is at school and he's drawing some. One day he's on his phone in the middle of class and the teacher notices that he's looking up bullets, like where how to purchase bullets, right? Um, so she's a little concerned. She makes the report and that happens. Then like the next day. He's, he's scribbling some um, pictures and notes, and he's got pictures of, um, of people being shot, bleeding, bullets, guns. Um, he talks about a, 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 he can't turn off this voice in his head. And the teacher, again, very concerned, does the right thing. Like, you, you look at this whole story, the teacher is the only one really doing the right thing and, and noticing that, hey, something's not right here. She actually takes a, a picture of his page after she takes a picture of his page, he then edits it to make it less um, threatening. And the parents are called in for a conference. And at the conference, you've got administrators from the school, you've got the parents, and you've got the shooter. And they, they talk about it. And then at no point do the parents say anything about the early Christmas gift that they gave him, which was a gun. Yeah. Right? And that's I think that's what's really gotten under... A lot of people's skin, and that's that's the the literal smoking gun in this case um, against the parents is they know something at this conference at the school that nobody else knows that he has a gun. Now, at that moment, the school has to decide what to do, and they allow him to go back to class. They want the parents to take him, but the parents say, "No, we're not taking him." And then he's allowed to go back to class, and he has a backpack. So, is there any liability? For the school and i thought that you know the school was kind of on the edge as well in terms of potential criminal liability here because we're pushing the criminal envelope uh these days in our courtrooms that they should have done something someone who's, who's drawing very uh threatening uh types of pictures researching bullets uh, but they don't know he ha has a gun but they do know he has a backpack they don't call the school resource officer there's no search. There's no attempt to just uh, get him out of school. What shocked me, though, is that he, he, he wasn't suspended from school. I've covered stories, Joshua, with um, kindergartners who would make this little gun thing with their fingers and get suspended. Like huh. six-year-olds getting suspended yeah. from kindergarten because of the zero tolerance policy when they play guns with their, with their fingers. And this is a, a high school student who is drawing these pictures and, and, and he was allowed to go back to class. But for the parents, it's what did they know? When did they know it? And what really was the worst thing that they ever could have done, which made them even look guilt, more guilty, was that they fled. They had to be yeah. tracked down. Like after this all happened, they're like found hiding in some office building somewhere. It was crazy. I yeah. didn't understand it. But um, it's, it's uncharted waters for prosecutors. We'll see what the jury does with it. Cause that's ultimately yeah. the jury's job, right? Their job is to tell us, uh, is this okay? Is this not okay? Yeah. I think you nailed it when you said it was purchasing that gun for him. Do you think I've always suspected this? Do you think if they had not purchased that gun for him, that there's not a way that they would have been charged in this case? Absolutely. Because not only did they purchase the gun as the early gift, they sort of um, posted some pictures on, on social media and and you knew about it and took him to the range and everything else. So they they knew that he was into this gun, yeah. and they knew from the prior day that he'd been searching for you know how to buy bullets. So all this stuff is going around in his head, and yeah. I don't know how much information they had about whatever sort of mental uh, illness he was suffering from, or the the nature of it, or the level of it. I'm not sure. Uh, anyone who's a parent knows sometimes it's tough to understand exactly what's going on with your teenager. But I, I think the line may be, I think the line may be in our society is that you as a parent, if you have that extra knowledge and you've provided him with a gun that maybe just maybe uh, you have some sort of an obligation to the rest of society to um, reveal that knowledge. Like yeah. in that meeting, if she said, oh, yeah, we just bought him a gun, you know, how would the school have reacted to that if they knew that right. he had a gun now? They'd be like, oh, wait a minute. 
Yeah. Maybe then they'd call the school resource officer. Maybe then they would search the backpack. I don't know. Yeah, no, uh, excellent point. We're, we are so frustrated and trying to find some solution to these senseless shootings that take place on schools that just rip apart our, our country and culture. And you can understand the, the frustration and anger that these prosecutors might have on why didn't these parents do more? And I completely understand and sympathize with that. And I completely understand your point about they should have disclosed that information. I just wonder the ramifications and the chilling effect on parents being second guessed. Is this too much? Maybe this is exactly where we should draw the line. But like you said, the the jurors will let us know. Yeah, it's a game changer. Um, This trial is an absolute game changer, um, because when I look at the school shooting cases, Um, There are two lines of defense. The the first line of defense is at home with the parents. Can they do something to stop it? The second line of defense is what can the school do to stop it, prevent it, um, and save lives? And in this case, uh, on both counts, there was failure. There was absolute failure. And and again, the only person who, who stood up and did something was that teacher who saw something and said something. And I wish, I wish uh, the voice of that teacher was a little bit louder. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, turning to another case involving gun violence in an entirely different setting, we're, we're talking about Alec Baldwin. He's the actor facing a wrongful death suit, lawsuit, civilly, following the shooting of Russ cinematographer uh, Helena Hutchins. Baldwin has repeatedly denied liability or accountability for his actions on set in a very public manner. Um, most recently, the claims that Helena told him to cock the gun before it was fired were made. And according to Baldwin, Uh, He was asked if she wanted him to cock the gun per the script, and she told him to do so. This is something new that we're learning. Another new development is that the armorer on the production uh, goes by the name of Hannah Gutierrez Reed claims she never was called to inspect the gun that killed the cinematographer. And uh, Gutierrez Reed also said Baldwin never accepted offers to gain additional gun training and that cost cutting measures. We keep hearing about this. Coming up, cost cutting measures prevented uh, crew access to these trainings as well. According to a statement by uh, Gutierrez Reed, Mr. Baldwin knew that he could never point a firearm at crew members under any circumstances and had a duty of safety to his fellow crew members. Yet he did point the gun at Helena before the fatal incident against all rules and common sense. Um, Talk to me, first of all, about these public statements that Baldwin continues to make. I'm sure against all counseling from his attorneys, is he creating harm for himself here to the point of possible criminal harm? Uh, yeah, well, let's let's talk about this case. You know, there's a civil lawsuit that's been filed. So we, we've talked about that uh, on the show and we've talked to, you know, lawyers about it. To me, the civil case is not about liability. It's about damages. Who, how much is each party paying? Because they're all responsible. There's no way she yeah. she should not have died. There was failure all along the line by everyone. Clearly. And if Alec Baldwin is going to say um, that he can have a gun in his hand, pointed at someone, squeeze the trigger and not be civilly liable for that death. Are you kidding me? Of course right. you are. That's That's a no brainer. It's just about damages. Um, what insurance companies are going to pay? Are any individuals going to pay? How is all that going to work out? To me, it's all about the potential criminal liability and, and, and who would be criminally liable. And the more Alec Baldwin talks, uh, the more difficult he's making it for himself. And, and I say that because this is a case I believe is 100 percent in that same gray area we are with the school shooters' parents. We're in the, in the land that I call prosecutorial discretion. It's a case that if we're an aggressive prosecutor and we want to push the envelope a little bit, we absolutely could bring charges. And if we don't bring charges, I don't think anyone would necessarily second guess that decision. I agree. It's completely in the discretion of the prosecutor. And you keep talking like this, the prosecutor is a human being. So they're going to hear stuff and they're going to, you know, you don't know who this prosecutor is and it might just rub her the wrong way. And she might say, you know what? He's tough. No, no, you are. Because this is a case that falls in that gray area. You hold a gun in your hand, you point at someone, you squeeze the trigger, you fire it and someone dies. Like 
to me, I make this analysis all the time. Some people agree. Some people jump up and scream at me saying you are so wrong. But Kim Potter, the police officer from from Minnesota, from uh, Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, thought she had her taser in her hand, but had her service weapon in her hand. She yelled, taser, 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 squeezed the trigger, shot and killed Dante Wright. Yeah. It was an accident. She didn't intend to do it. She clearly didn't intend to do it. But the prosecutor there and the jury there said, no, there are some accidents that are so egregious that it goes beyond. And I say, well, how is Alec Baldwin any different than Kim Potter? I'm trying to figure that out because they're both at work. They're both doing their jobs. Neither one intended harm. Neither one of them thought they were holding a loaded gun. Neither one of them thought they were holding a loaded gun. So, yeah. you know, where's the difference? The only difference is, is that Kim Potter is dealing with a defendant who is attempting to flee and is putting people into danger and has a warrant out for his arrest. Alec Baldwin is blocking a scene, not even shooting a scene. Uh, no pun intended. They're not even shooting scene, but just doing walking through the blocking of a scene. So um, how is she any different than him? So why wouldn't he be charged if this is the world we're living in? And I'll just put a footnote to all of this. Uh, as a prosecutor, I'm not that guy. I never thought that these, these gray area, negligent, accidental cases were ones that I felt needed to be criminally prosecuted. I, I didn't. But since we're in that world now, I believe in equal justice across the board. And I don't think there's an exemption for someone who is an actor versus someone who's a police officer. Really, really strong point. Excellent point. The, the other question I have is this. Now, I believe it's five months that they've been looking into this. And, you know, you can say, oh, we're waiting on ballistics and everything out there. They're not waiting on ballistics. They know where the who shot the gun. They know where the bullet came from. None of that. None of that is in question at this point. Five months to be waiting on trying to make a decision. And like you said, if they came out and said, no, we found no criminal liability here. We feel this was an accident. I don't think there's many folks who are going to lose their minds over that. So as each day goes on, are you thinking they might be closer to a decision to actually file against him. And they're just, there's a lot of hand wringing going on in New Mexico about, Oh my God, we're going to, we're going to file charges against like Baldwin. Yeah. Well, here's the part that I think is, is why it's taking a little bit longer. Um, the outfit doing the investigation. I don't think they've ever had a case like this before. Number one, because no. it's kind of, it's a very rural area in the middle of nowhere. That's why they were, um, um, you know, filming the Western there. Um, but there's more than Alec Baldwin that they have to look at. They have to look at everyone that touched a gun. So they're looking at the potential liability of Alec Baldwin, the uh, assistant director who handed him the gun, the armorer, and then the person who supplied the ammunition to the armorer, right? So the person who supplied the ammunition was supposed to give her a box of dummies, right? Dummy rounds, which yeah. look like live rounds. They're different than blanks. I'm learning all of this. I don't shoot guns. I've never been in a movie. Uh, would like to be in a movie, but don't necessarily want to shoot a gun. Um, but it looks like it. So, you know, did did he, was his recklessness, and in, 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 is he the one that allowed that bullet to be in a box that said dummies? Um, what did the armor do? Who actually put the rounds into the weapon? And then who checked the weapon? So I think the timing has to do with that whole chain of custody and looking at the potential criminal liability of all the people involved there. That's number one. Number two, my understanding is they've got to interview hundreds of witnesses and everyone is in CYA mode at this point. So that may be a little bit uh, more challenging. And then uh, the, the most difficult part, which is what you referenced is trying to figure out, okay, what exactly do we do with this? Because this is really on, on the fence, it absolutely, anytime you talk about negligence in a criminal context, it's always on the fence. You know, it's easy if someone's drunk driving and gets into a, a car wreck and kills someone. But how about someone who just kind of innocently makes a left turn that they thought they could make, but they weren't, and they take someone's life? Is that a crime or is that an accident? And that's what we're trying to figure out here. Uh, personally, as a prosecutor, I lean towards um, it's civil. You're, you're, you're responsible, um, but it's not about taking away your liberty. For me, it's about your, your state of mind at the time and your state of mind clearly. I know Alec Baldwin didn't want to kill anyone. 
I know the armor didn't want anyone dead. No one wanted anyone dead. So um, it has to be extreme, extreme recklessness for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of questions that you bring up and, and hopefully we'll get the answers to all of those soon. Um, all right. Let's talk about Jesse Smollett. Uh, this <laughs> Empire actor was sentenced to 150 days in jail, 30 months of felony probation, and was also ordered to pay 120,000, 120 on 106,000 in restitution to the city of Chicago. These charges stem from the fraudulent report of an attack that he was said uh, that he is described as a hate crime. His jail sentence was cut short after a decision by an Illinois appellate court. Uh, he served less than a week behind bars, um, his team arguing that he, he, should, he should be allowed to be freed uh, pending his conviction. So we've had this back and forth throughout the kind of extremes of the country of everybody losing their minds that, you know, he got jail. Now, now he's out of jail. Um, you watch this. My, my first question is, you've seen plenty of Senate sentencing hearings and I've seen plenty and you watch this one very closely. Um, I've never seen anything like it. What what were your thoughts on this sentencing hearing? It was it was unreal in many yeah. respects. You know, from from the bench, from the judge, this was the judge sat through the trial, and I felt like the judge at the time he was sentencing uh, Jesse. It was like I've been sitting here, I've been listening to these arguments for years now. Um, this case was overwhelmingly clear that this was a hate crime hoax. It's obvious to everyone, yet you continue to deny it. I can't say anything, but now it's my turn to talk. And uh, I thought the judge was eloquent. Uh, the judge was, 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 like, was like just saying everything that all of us have been thinking following this case. And Jussie's family responded to it like, this is outrageous. Like, like, you can't say that. He was like so rude to Jussie in that court. Wait, he's a convicted felon. That's what judges do every day in court. <laughs> and, and he was nice to Jesse, too. He, he, he gave Jesse credit for part of his life, but he was like this Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing that he that he was describing. And to me, it, it, it really instituted the disconnect between Jesse Small and his family and what this was about. And, yeah. and they, they were clinging to this argument that he was the victim. Jesse is the victim. And this judge victimized him inside the courtroom. And I'm like, what planet are you on? Like, what people have to believe that that two MAGA hat wearing men happen to be walking through the streets of Chicago during a, a polar vortex <laughs> at two in the morning with a noose and bleach and just knew that somehow, some way, this um, African American gay actor would be going to Subway for a sandwich, and at that point, we are going to teach him a lesson because this is MAGA country. Right. And by the way, the two MAGA hat wearing men are not—they're—they're um, they're immigrants from Africa. <laughs> what? And he reported his attackers as being white. Yeah. And and he knew them. And I, you know, I would think he would recognize their voices to a certain extent. And then somehow he was able to fight the, these guys off. Have you seen pictures of these guys, Joshua? <laughs> they are bigger than professional wrestlers. Yeah, there's there's no mistaking them for someone else. If they wanted to give Jesse Spullett a beating, he would have gotten a beating. He's not <laughs> fighting him off. I don't care how many karate lessons he had uh, in, in any of his movies or shows. No. So the whole thing was preposterous, yet they were clinging to the fact that he was a victim. And, and for that, uh, they, they lose credibility. Um, and, I, and I don't think that he was the victim of anything. I believe it was a hate crime hoax. That being said, there is still that big issue looming in this case, Joshua, which is double jeopardy. Yeah. And this yeah. is for real. And I didn't, I didn't know the procedural history of this case that well, because when the trial was happening, we were in the midst of uh, the Ahmad Arbery murder trial. Um, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse case, and we were we were covering all of those while this was happening. So I I really didn't focus in on the procedural history until afterwards. And they have a legitimate 
legitimate argument that his Fifth Amendment right is being violated, not against self-incrimination, but for being punished twice for the same crime. And I'm interested in your take on it because um, I, I, I think he could very well overturn the conviction, but not just overturn it, get it thrown out and, and walk away from this. Yeah. Well, just to kind of catch uh, people listening up as to what we're talking about, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was that the original deal, as it were, that he had with the the state prosecutor's office was that he could get this case dismissed, but he had to forfeit the bail that he had already posted for his release on his original arrest. The argument being that that money, that forfeiture of that money is a punishment. Oftentimes, punishment can be a fine or a fee. And so the court saying or the prosecutor saying you need to forfeit that money to us and then we're going to kind of you know resolve this thing, that that is enough alone for jeopardy to attach the first time around. So the fact that he received that punishment and the case was resolved, it doesn't matter if it went through a jury trial or not. It was resolved with a punishment the first time around. And now that he's been tried again and punished again, that that's double jeopardy. And I agree with you. I think I think it's certainly something an appellate court is going to have to give us an answer on because it, it's it, it's a strong enough question for legal minds around the country to be going. What what happened here and how how is that viewed? Yeah. And as as ridiculous and silly as this case is, uh, if if this issue made its way to the Supreme Court of the United States, which is, just, I mean, it's possible, who knows? Um, this is one where if you looked at justices who were, you know, constitutional uh, justices, justices that look at the words of the Constitution in their literal meetings and had this case in front of them, we'd say, yeah, well, the first time he was charged, the prosecutor dismissed the charges, he forfeited $10,000 and did some community service on his own. That's tantamount to punishment. And the Fifth Amendment literally says you can't be punished twice for the same crime. And, and if he ends up winning, to me, he won because of the privilege that he possesses, the privilege of being um, uh, connected, the privilege of having those political connections and, and the prosecutor giving him a deal that Nobody else is getting a deal. You don't. This doesn't happen in our system, folks. You don't get indicted. And then the prosecutor says, well, just give some money and I'll just dismiss it. No, usually there's like a formal program you go into. Probation makes sure that you fulfill certain obligations like community service, paying a fine, doing whatever. And then you go back in, in front of a court, in front of a judge in a courtroom and everything's put on the record and dismissed. This was like a backroom deal because he was politically connected and he has privilege and money. And if he ends up winning, that's why he won. Yeah. Well, you described it as silly and ridiculous, and I agree with you. And to add to that, I'd like to talk to you about an even more silly and ridiculous case. Uh, this is the last one we'll talk about today. So quickly, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. Johnny Depp has suffered a major loss ahead of his $100 million defamation uh, trial against ex-wife Amber Heard. Depp sued Heard for libel in Virginia after the Washington Post published her opinion piece on domestic violence, uh, where, by the way, his name was never mentioned. A judge ruled Thursday that Amber Heard can argue to a jury that she should be protected from a libel lawsuit because of her 2018 op-ed on domestic violence deals with a matter of public interest. The ruling comes just weeks before a lengthy trial is scheduled to begin in Fairfax. Both Depp and Heard are scheduled to appear in court and testify, which will be amazing. Not to mention the 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 parade of numerous other Hollywood figures that are listed as potential witnesses. Vinny, jump right in. What what are we going to expect here? Is this just going to be fireworks? And should we grab the popcorn? Oh, absolutely. This is and and this is really a criminal case that is kind of wrapped into a defamation claim. It's not a criminal trial. Uh, but it's about domestic violence. And, and Johnny Depp is saying that Amber Heard accused him of domestic violence and it destroyed his career. Amber Heard, though, has a counterclaim against Johnny Depp saying that he's he's accusing her of lying and it has destroyed her career. They were married for just over a year. It was the most bitter divorce. But these are two people who absolutely hate one another. 
And usually at Court TV, we don't cover civil cases because they always settle. These people hate each other so much that it makes settlement very unlikely. And they're going to air their grievances publicly inside of a courtroom. And we'll see whether or not the jury believes Johnny Depp is a wife beater or not. And that really becomes the issue here. That becomes the issue. Uh, but, to, but to figure it out, you're going to have dozens and dozens of witnesses, videotapes, audio tapes, and of course, the testimony of Amber Heard, A-lister, Johnny Depp, A-lister, Elon Musk is supposed to testify, the richest man in the world. He may be testifying remotely from space. Um, James Franco is scheduled to testify, Ellen Barkin, and countless others. So uh, get ready. This is like War of the Roses, uh, but inside a courtroom. Yeah. And, and your point being that, listen, when you're when the, the accusation is liable, a defense to that is I wasn't lying. It's all true. And let me prove it to you. So you're absolutely right. This is going to come be, turn into kind of a domestic violence case. Was he violent against her? Because if he was and they can prove that, then his libel suit against her uh, falls apart. It It's going to make for if nothing else, some really great television. And I'm imagining that you're going to have uh, some really great hot takes on the whole thing. Absolutely. And it's all it's all happening in April. So uh, amazingly, it's 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 going forward and um, and we'll be covering it. The I don't know how it's going to turn out. This case is very unpredictable because there's cross claims. They're each going after. I think he initially sued her for 50 million. She counterclaimed against him for 100 million. They have that kind of money. So um, this is a real case. And uh, we'll see. But but getting getting to the truth of what happened is going to be a a, a long journey for this uh, jury. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, Vinny, thank you so much for coming on this week. Where can people find out more about you? Okay, well, you, uh, you go to my Facebook page, Vinny Politan Court TV. Uh, I give you updates on everything I'm doing. You can watch me on Court TV every night. Uh, if you have a digital antenna, we are broadcasting 90% of the country. And then we're on like uh, every streaming service you can think of, including uh, YouTube. Uh, we're on that as well. Uh, the, the YouTube that you pay for. So anyhow, um, great to be here. Thanks so much, Joshua. Appreciate it. And uh, Absolutely. when are we covering one of your trials is the question. <laughs> soon enough. Soon enough. You better um, not object to cameras. <laughs> of course not. I just okay. want to make sure I've got my hair cut. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. You can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar. Sidebar.